Okay, in Black Seas, sometimes the crew quality matters and sometimes the actual nation you happen to play actually comes into it, be a, become a factor in whether you can win or lose a scenario. Today we're going to talk about those two topics in this episode. Hello, welcome to today's Hedgehog Naval Academy. I figured we'd see things a little differently today. Um, we're not going to talk so much about rules. We we're going to talk about some rules, but in, I think more of a casual discussion manner because uh, this, what I'm about to talk about, are really options. Okay, uh, like I mentioned in the intro, we're going to be talking about crew quality, and we're going to be talking about national rules. Okay, so the, what I want to do before we get any further into this is remind everybody that these are things that you can use in the case of uh, when you build your own uh, fleets with points, buying a veteran or inexperienced crew will change the point values. And that is something that you don't have to do. You can do, agree with your opponent, just to leave everything regular. Uh, in the case of national rules, the rule book even explicitly states that you should agree with your opponent and these should not be used during in competitive formats because these introduce potentially unbalancing rules, but add a lot of flavor. So let's kind of dive into this. Let's talk about crew quality first. And the reason I want to do that is that this is actually something that's, uh, I think, a good thing to add to your game. So that's my opinion, but that's where I'm coming from. So crew quality is important. And here's the chart I'll go ahead and put up here. Um, this is really the core use of the, the crew quality rules. It's basically made around skill tests. Now, there's other things to talk about in a minute, but skill tests is the biggie. You'll notice regular ships, like we've been using for the bulk of this uh, Academy series, have all been regular and make skill tests on a five or six. In experience, though, you'll notice is a six. Only a six. One in six chance of success. And veterans, a 50% chance of success. So you have pretty big swing. Uh, if you go inexperienced, you're cutting your chances in half. If you go veteran, you're increasing your chances by 50%. Um, major changes in the skill set, skill side. Now, this isn't as important when you're trying to evade colliding with an, another ship, because let's just use experienced, uh, uh, sorry, inexperienced as an example. You try to evade a collision, you're plus two, so we need a four better. And the opponent, unless he's inexperienced, needs a five or better, or sorry, a three or better, or a two or better if they're veteran. And only one of you has to make it. So. In that sense, for collision evasion, it's not that big a deal. However, these are, there are other very, very important uh, places where this makes a difference. <clears throat> One is musket fire. That's a skill uh, test. And that is used, you know, it's an extra upgrade. Sorry, not an upgrade. It's a, you can buy an upgrade to it, but when you're within three inches of an enemy ship, you fire on it, you get to just make a skill test to add three more damage. Inexperienced are rarely going to be able to do that. Veteran crews are likely going to do that, so that's a definitely a good use for it. You know, if you want the veteran in that case, and inexperience it's going to hamper you a bit. But when it comes to the skill tests, such as and this is the biggie, uh, striking the colors, huge difference. Again, one in six chance for an inexperienced, four in six chance for a veteran, and worse when it comes to disengaging from entangled ships. That's a minus one penalty. So an inexperienced ship cannot break out of an entangled situation. Their ships are stuck, locked together, until the other ship, hopefully it's not inexperienced as well, breaks free. But a regular is only going to break free on a six. A veteran is only going to break free on a five or better. So kind of difficult there, especially if you're entangled with your own ship. So it has a major impact going to inexperienced. Now... <clears throat> Where it does also play pretty heavily is shooting. Remember, you start off with the five to hit and modify from there. Well, inexperienced immediately is minus two. You're starting at threes. Veterans, you're starting at seven, so that's plus two. That's a big improvement. And so, arguably, you might want to go veteran for that, right? Not a bad idea, because you, the more, uh, more dice you get to roll, the higher the hit number. The more hits you're going to get, great. The only thing that uh, inexperience does is 
if you get end up going low, you're if you hit, you're more likely to get a crit. But again, you're rarely hitting, so is it really that big a deal? Is it something to go with? And lastly, is when you're actually uh, you know your skill test to grapple is a skill test, so it matters. But once you're on board and you're fighting, now your two hit uh, number changes. On a D10, you have five to inflict damage, five or less. For regular, six or less for vet. One, or sorry, four or less for inexperienced. Now the dispar disparity there isn't as much. It's not as big a deal, but it's still important. And again, what's worse is if you are going to be inexperienced, you're going to, on a one in six chance to avoid striking colors, if you're less than half your, if, you, if you're a loser, if you lose the combat, and you're less than half your ship total. So hull points, it's like very dangerous. Now, why would you do it? Well, two reasons. Number one, merchant ships are assumed to be inexperienced. You buy them that way, okay? And you really, you, if you, you, know, you can agree with your part, your opponent to upgrade them. When I play with Dave and, and he's, we play as his veteran, sorry, his uh, pirates, merchant ships, as regular, simply because it just makes sense, okay? They're using a pirate ship, a merchant ship, but they're an experienced crew compared to a sailors that are just there for, for the merchant navy, merchant marine. Um, but when you buy veterans, you have to add up the total cost of your ship with all of its upgrades and then tack on another 20%, rounding up to the nearest uh, 10. If you buy it inexperienced, you do the same thing. You add up and you subtract 20%, rounding up to the nearest 10. So you do save you know, points going with an experienced. And arguably, there's times more ships are better than fewer ships. But your combat capability increases with veterans. So you, know, you might have fewer ships if you go vet, but is it really a payoff? Really, it all boils down to your play style and what you want to do with the Navy. Personally, um, when I play historically, I try to keep them regular. Uh, now for the Spanish, they tended to have less experienced uh, crew simply because they were uh, not for the uh, during the time of the War of Independence for uh, the U.S. Americans, but definitely during the Napoleonic Wars for sure. They had dealt dealt with this. I believe it's it was an epidemic, flu epidemic of some sort. I forget exactly what it was, but they had, had lost a lot of their population and naval crew. So, in addition to that, the war chest, the, the treasury, was kind of stretched, so they kind of mustered out their crews and put their larger ships into storage, you know, the first rates into storage, to save money. So, when it came time to come to war, you had to find a lot of new crew for, to replace the ones that were mustered out and the ones that died from the, uh, pen, the uh, epidemic. And now, you've got an experienced crew. So... I have, I have yet to actually run any of my Spanish ships inexperienced, but they almost always run uh, regular. Uh, when I do run the Sintisma Trinidad, uh, that is vet because it's whenever you buy a named ship uh, in, that's presented in the rule books, it's always assumed to be veteran. All right, so anyway, so veteran versus inexperienced, it's entirely your choice. There's pros and cons to doing it. If you are playing a narrative campaign, I think that actually could be a neat thing to do, adding in some veteran crew or some inexperienced crew. And you'll notice in, as we do some of these build your own fleets for either our bat reps or this Naval Academy series, you're going to see some of the naval exercises where Dave's ships are going to have some veteran crews. Okay. Uh, I don't think I'm going to have any, but again, I haven't built all the, my fleet lists yet for those scenarios. All right, so let's kind of move on and talk about national rules, special rules. And this one explicitly states in the rule book, like I said before, add this, almost at your own risk, uh, but agree with your opponent beforehand, because these can often unbalance a game. Now, the reason for that is, now we're ignore the, you know, special ships, the named ships, because those are special cases. We're going to ignore the special uh, characters that you can buy, because those are, those are like upgrades, right? Ignore those for now. 
consider those in the same way you would buying upgrades, okay, or buying a ship with upgrades to equi be equivalent to that named ship, okay. And remember to buy it veteran, so you kind of compare point, point costs. So we're not going to talk about those. We're going to talk about the national rules themselves that each of the four fleets get. And this is where you have to come to an agreement with your opponent. Um, we typically, in the naval exercises, we've, you've seen this, we are not using national rules. Just to keep the game simple. And we will probably introduce that uh, as we do some of our bat reps, but maybe not any. In this discussion, I'll kind of talk through why. All right, so one problem with uh, national rules is they don't cost anything. Your navy, if and only if you have one of the four navies in the book, Britain, France, Spain, and the U.S., if you have one of those four, you get national special, national special rules. If you are the Swedes or the, uh, uh, sorry, the uh, French Russians or any other smaller country that isn't one of those four, you don't get anything. No bonuses, no, of course, no penalties either, but, so, maybe that's a little unfair right now. All right, so let's dive in. Let's go through these four, and let's talk about why you may or may not want to use them, or maybe why they're even there in the first place. Let's start with Britain, because we're going to do these in order, British, French, Spain, and U.S. Britain has two special rules, and actually they're based pretty much on historical uh, reality. The fact is the Royal Navy, sorry, the Royal Navy in Great Britain, I say that because the Spanish also called their Navy the Royal Navy, just in Spanish it's Real Armada. Uh, the first national rule drilled reflects the fact that the British were often drilling their cannoneers. They took pride in doing well with their cannon exercises. Matter of fact, that is a British naval trait that has gone on in through World War II, even probably to today. I don't, I don't know the modern uh, military history for Britain as well as I do basically World War II and before. So because they're so drilled in cannon uh, use and gunfire, they actually get a plus one to shooting. So they're hitting on sixes uh, at a start and then up just from there. That plus one makes a big difference, because if you remember, any time you have enough penalties to bring it to zero, you miss automatically. Well, this gives you one more, and if you think about it, uh, long range is two. Um, if your opponent is a small ship, and if it's going uh, fast, you know, for example, one uh, uh, goes 11, or ten, more than ten, that's another one. So you're eight minus four, you're down to one. British would be hitting on twos. If instead it was long range, uh, and you are firing high, that's also minus two. And it's a small ship, right there you're hitting on, you're missing. But Britons are hitting on one. And the worst thing about this is that if uh, they decide to use chain shot, all of a sudden now it's up to two, okay? So they're hitting more often, half the time they're going to be cannon, uh, they're going to be critical hits. So having that plus one is a, you know, is a big deal. Now the other one is the Admiralty. Now the Admiralty gives you essentially every single ship in your fleet, once per game it can reroll any skill test once, but you have to make that, uh, you have to accept that new skill test. So this is success or fail. For example, Let's say you want to grapple with your opponent's ship. You want to roll. If you fail, you re-roll, right? Great. But what if you're going in a position, you know, you can only grapple after your second move, right? and your, or sorry, after your final move. If you're going to battle sail, and you're going to end up too far away to grapple, you might instead want to entangle, all right? So what you'll do is you'll steer your ship toward the target ship, end your move within an inch, roll to avoid entangling, which you get a bonus to, so yes, you'll probably roll a three or better. Well, that may be one you want to fail, because you know you're not going to be able to grapple, so now's your only chance. So re-roll that, hopefully you can get a one or two, and then guess what? You're grappled, even though you wouldn't have already been able to. So 
think in terms of, you know, what are the possibilities? Where would failing a test be beneficial? Where would passing a test be beneficial? And in either case, you can re-roll the skill test. So there's a lot of flexibility there. Now, does that really reflect how good sailors, good leaders they had? I don't know. I can't really speak to that. I think it's maybe characterful, but is it... I don't know. It's just, again... But that's what it is. And so those are the only two rules you get. Both are good. They're additions or bonuses that you get for your fleet. Unlike with some of them. So let's go to the French, which arguably is the best set of uh, special rules for any of the nations. They actually get three. Uh, their very first one, now, okay, what's really neat before I start, all three of these are based on historical realities. The ships, French ships, by design, were known, had ever had a reputation for being two things, fast and very durable. Okay, so to reflect that, they have the streamlining special rule, we are spring streamline special rules. So that means you can buy the streamline hull upgrade at a discount. So instead of spending uh, 30 points, it only costs 20 points. That's a 30 percent, 33, you know, one third savings. Um, the other one's double planking. You get the sturdy bonus, an extra 20 hull, for only 40 points instead of 60 points. That's a huge savings. And that reflects well how difficult it was to you know knock out some of those French ships. Okay. The third bonus is really a good one, and if if I like to, to play the French fleet, this is one that I would really enjoy. Uh, it is the aiming high. You see, the French tactics favored using uh, aiming high to take out the opponent's masts and rigging as quickly as possible. A ship that can't move is no risk, to no harm, no threat to you at all. So that's what they do. And of course, then you can at your leisure come back and capture it because you can stay out of its broadside. You can rake it as almost at will. So they get a bonus. So essentially, normally it's minus two when you're aiming high, but for French it's only minus one. Now think about this: they decide to use chain shot. They don't have any penalty to aiming high. That is huge. So they can aim high and hit as frequently with chain shot as they would aiming at the hull with regular round shot. That's pretty effective. A great set of three rules. Now unfortunately I think that the double planking one or something like it should also go to the Spains, the Spanish Navy. So let's move on to the Spanish Navy and let's talk about it. They, they get two rules. One is a benefit, the other isn't, and they're missing one in my opinion. I'll start with the missing one just so you know where I'm headed with this. The Spanish ships, along with the French ships, all they both had a reputation for being sturdy. Over and over, the British would remark on how much gunfire a Spanish ship could take before, well, to make it sink, and a lot of times it didn't sink. They were able to capture it and then use it intact without a whole lot of repair, relatively speaking. So, the Spanish should have that as well. Some, don't call it double planking because that's not necessarily how they did it. The French used a certain way of building their ships to accomplish it. The Spanish used a different way of building their ships, but still achieved the same result. So that's also why you'll see a lot of my ships built the sturdy special rule. Okay, so that's the one they're missing. But what two did they really get? Well, the first one lines up real well with historical. Uh, it's called heavily armed. Now, I think it's a, a little weak but it allows you to give your first rates, but only your first rates, a free upgrade of Overgun, which is a 100 point upgrade normally. It's free. The only downside is that if you take that, because of all the extra guns you're putting on your first rate, now your ship, anytime it wants to go to full sail, has to make a skill test. Okay, so regular crew on a five or six, if you want to go to full sail, how often are you going to go to full sail in a battle? Not a lot, maybe. Now, if you're trying to get off the table edge for something, that may come in handy. But really, I don't think that's a huge disadvantage considering you're getting 100 free points of upgrades, which is an additional can heavy cannon, an additional light cannon. That's, to me, big. And it reflects what the Spanish really did. Where I think they fell short here is the Spanish didn't just do this to the first rates. All of, most of their, a lot of their first rates 
were built as second rates and upgunned to become first rates. A lot of their second rates were built as third rates, upgunned to become uh, second rates. And there are some thirds that upgun to become eventually first rate. So this should have been applied to all classes, all from large third rates up. But that's my personal opinion. But still, I love having an extra uh, couple cannons on my first rate. So pretty good special rule. Unfortunately, the only other special rule they get is a disadvantage. It's called out of practice. And it's fair, if you, again, if you're talking about historical realities, because of the... Uh, financial issues and the uh, epidemic issues that I talked about earlier, the Spain and Spanish fleet had trouble keeping experienced crews on board. It really rarely happened. So, the, what you basically get a penalty here when you put the out of practice special rule if you're a Spanish fleet player, instead of costing 20% to upgrade to a veteran, it costs you 30%. That could be a lot of points. That could be a whole nother ship. So, it's a pretty big penalty. Uh, but, again, you don't have to use it, because like, I, don't, I don't buy any of mine veteran, and the Centisma Trinity comes veteran, so I don't have that penalty there. So, I'm kind of okay with that. So, that's the Spanish national rules. Finally, the U.S. Uh, it's, again, historically founded, and I think there's a pretty good balance here. Uh, if you think about, there's two things that, to think about with the uh, U.S. fleet. First of all, they knew they couldn't afford large ships. So they built their frigates, the, the regular run-of-the-mill you know, run frigate, larger and more heavily armed than their European counterparts. In addition to that, they built what are also, it's often termed super frigates, which are the large, heaviest ones with the 50-plus cannon on them, bordering on you know, a ship of the line. A smaller ship line. So, I guess you call them one of the fourth rates. But, so what they have done, or has done, is given a overfitting, or so overfitted special rule to the U.S. For the one disadvantage of not being able to build any third, second, or first rates in your fleet, you are able to buy the overgunned upgrade for 80 points. So a 20% discount. So now you've got frigates running, you know, for the cost of a brig, you add a cannon, a heavy cannon, light cannon, to your ship. Not necessarily as good as having two heavy cannon on a brig, but that is adding to making your one ship, you know, stronger. Now it's a frigate, so you're going to have the opportunity to put two upgrades on it, so that could be one, and you can do what you want with the other. So that's, I think, to be honest, a pretty good one. The other one is drilled, just like the Royal Navy. The Americans learned, you know, practice makes perfect, and so they also get a plus one to hit. So they're going to be hitting more often than not, and they're going to hit in situations where other uh, fleets are simply going to miss. So, pretty good one. I don't know if there should be any others for the U.S. Uh, I think these are pretty sound. So, you can see, for no point increase, the French player is getting upgrades free, uh, more cheaply. The U.S. player is getting upgrades che more cheaply. The U.S. player and the British player can hit more often. And the Spanish player gets one free upgrade only on one class of a ship, and you can only have two of those per thousand points. And is it a penalty for going to veteran? The French have some additional benefits for some upgrades and shooting high. So... All of a sudden, you're, instead of all your navies being even, your Spanish kind of drop down, your Americans go up a little bit, because remember, they, don't, they can't have third, first, and second rates. Your, I mean, this is my opinion, British go up a notch or two, and the, Spanish, the French go up even more. So they become more point efficient than the British or any of the others. That can unbalance uh, a game. Now, if you do it a campaign, hey, that's great. Throw it in. If it adds flavor, by all means do it. And that's the key to all the rules we covered today. If it adds to your game, makes it more enjoyable, by all means, add them in. As long as your opponent is agreeable. And if you don't like them, you don't have to use them. Okay? All right. So thanks a lot. hope this video is kind of a 
enjoyable to listen to and helps you kind of understand where you know why you consider some of these other kind of rules that are uh, available to you and make the decision for yourself do me a favor and well not only share like and subscribe please that because it helps the channel but also comment below on why you feel certain rules or uh, upgrades you know sorry crew quality upgrades are favorable or not uh, you know what are your opinions on it let's just have an open discussion keep it civil and We'll all learn from it and have a great time with this game. All right, thanks a lot. See you guys in the next video. Bye-bye.